um, as well. So firstly, before I introduce um, our speaker here today, thank you everyone for being here today for International Humanitarian Month um, and our DEI event. We're gonna learn more about the country of Estonia and an important topic referred to as just transition. Um, before I introduce today's speaker though, I would be remiss not to mention that it's from a connection of our former colleague and friend, Pamela Picard, that we're fortunate enough to have our speaker Ivan here with us today. Some of you might know that Pamela's son currently lives in Estonia and she was very passionate about this amazing country and was very much looking forward to today's presentation. So we proceed in Pamela's honor. Um, and I just briefly wanted to, to share a picture of Pamela. Is everybody able to see that? So just a moment here um, to honor and recognize our friend. And um, so now I will introduce our speaker, Ivan. Ivan, thanks so much for being here. Ivan Sergeyev is an architect, a Fulbright scholar, and an expert on urban rejuvenation. Ivan will join us to discuss how Europe's ambition of ensuring a fair and equitable transition toward climate neutrality influences communities on the ground. Having started his architectural studies at the Estonian Academy of Arts, Ivan received his MArch degree from Virginia Tech School of Architecture and Design while on a Fulbright Fellowship in the US. Ivan has gained diverse professional experience in Estonia, Netherlands, and the US, most notably at OMA, AMO, and New York City. Between 2016 and 2020, while holding the position of the Chief City Architect of Estonia's easternmost city, Narva, Ivan also led the city's bid for the European Capital of Culture title and co-organized the Music and City Culture Festival, Station Narva. Currently, Ivan coordinates the process of the just transition in Ida, Veroma, Estonia. During our time together, we will learn what just transition stands for, its origins, and why it matters to people around the world. Okay, Ivan, feel free to take it away. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see me uh, and hear me okay. Yep. All right. Um, let me share my screen now. And... Um... And we can go from there. Can you see my slides? All right. sure Thanks for nodding. That's always very helpful when somebody actually nods in <laughs> <on> the camera. <laughs> I mean, with this Zoom world, it's, you know, one tends to feel a little bit out of touch with like the reality on the ground as I can't really see, you know, the auditorium or anything. Uh, but it's always very nice when somebody actually, you know, nods or smiles or you can see some sort of reaction. So. But anyway, so hi from my side. I'm calling right now from, yeah, uh, snowy, freezing Estonia, uh, which is in Northeastern Europe. Um, and uh, when Pamela, I, I know Pamela's son, um, Carl. So when, uh, when Pamela reached out to me and asked if I would like to speak about humanitarian issues, uh, since I deal with the just transition, uh, just in the sense, the word just is used here in the sense of fair. So if I want to speak about the just transition and how we approach it in Estonia, then being an alum of Virginia Tech and uh, Virginia as a state being very dear to me, spent two and a half years there, um, you know, obviously I jumped at the opportunity. So thanks for, for having me today. And uh, yeah, since uh, Jenny already introduced me quite uh, thoroughly, then I think we can skip this slide. And what I wanted to do first is just to give you a quick few words about Estonia as a country since uh, I assume that not a lot of you uh, have been here. It is a pretty far remote region of Europe. Um, and so maybe a little introduction is due. So if we look at the map, uh, then uh, what we see is that Estonia is, yeah, as I said, it's in the Northeastern part of Europe. So the, uh, uh, the bordering countries would be Sweden, Finland. Finland uh, so basically the Nordics, what you understand is the Nordics. The total area of Estonia is um, about what is it, like 17.4 thousand uh, miles, square miles. So if you compare it to the United States, then it's tiny. It's like super tiny. Uh, the population is also at least, I don't know, almost 300 times smaller than the US. 
So it is a tiny country. I mean, a single city in the United States, a, a mid-sized city in the US would be the same size as, a, as a, my entire country. So it gives you a sense of perspective um, of, of what kind of you know, uh, volumes we're talking about. Um, the average temperature is not that high, so we're pretty far north. Um, and we also are quite notorious for having completely white nights in the summer and then virtually no sun uh, during winter. So currently it's not, it, it just, um, you know, uh, it, it's 4 p.m., 4.05, and it's completely pitch dark out here. <laughs> so, so yeah, during the winter, we sort of uh, put a lot of lights on uh, in the buildings and just make sure that we stay, you know, somewhere light so that we have some, by, eat vitamin D tablets all the time and things like this. So it's, uh, you know, a Nordic climate. Uh, importantly as well is that uh, Estonia, although it's pretty east, uh, we're also neighboring Russia. Uh, Estonia is part of NATO. Estonia is part of the EU. Um, we became the part of the EU in 2004. So we've been there for, well, almost 20 years by now. Uh, and uh, yeah, to continue from here um, is uh, Estonia's like, let's say the core messages that I would like to convey speaking about Estonia generally is that first of all, it is a democratic country. So um, as I already mentioned, we're part of the EU and NATO, but we're also uh, among some of the top countries for press freedom. We have some of the least levels of corruption in the world. Uh, so it's a pretty, um, let's say, horizontal, very direct democracy uh, liking country. What I mean by direct democracy is basically if you have an initiative that gathers a, a thousand signatures, it goes directly to parliament. I mean, I'm only two phone calls away from my president. So it's 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 pretty radically horizontal. When we speak with uh, when I speak with colleagues, even from the other countries of the European Union, then people get blown away by the fact that I can just speed dial my minister on the phone and talk to him or her actually currently directly, asking for some you know policy advice or 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 whatever. So it's uh, it's pretty crazy in that sense, but but we value that quite a bit. Uh, also, if you've ever heard about Estonia at all, then you probably have heard it through the, let's say, the digital aspect. So Estonia is pretty well known for being a very digitally advanced economy, a digitally advanced uh, country. For example, I mean, it takes me here, I've written three minutes to file your taxes just as a, as a let's say, a mean example or as, a, as an average example. Actually, it takes me much less to file my taxes. Obviously, if you invest in stocks, then maybe five minutes, but, but not much longer. So it's, it's, it's crazy if you compare it again to some countries, let's say Germany or even the United States where you have to hire someone to file your taxes. Here it's completely automated, it's completely transparent uh, and it gets submitted uh, pretty much automatically. So yeah, we're one of the first countries to, to adopt online voting, which is again, completely secure. We've been using this popular thing called blockchain for like years by now. So not really understanding what the hype is about. It's like, it's old news for us. So, and uh, and oh, that also helps us be one of the most entrepreneurial countries in Europe as well. Again, being a tiny country, it's not like, you know, you have a lot of resources. So you have to capitalize on the things that you do have and the things that we do have, or let's say the biggest asset and the largest, um, how do I say, um, you know, natural resource that we have is are the brains of the people that live here. So we really do invest in education. Uh, it's one of the best educational systems in Europe. Estonia scores uh, really high on PISA tests, uh, you know, consistently. Um, we have a great welfare system, as in like, for example, maternity leave can last up to one and a half years. So we do invest in the people in, you know, in, in things that matter on a very human level. And the last thing maybe that kind of sort of introduces the topic that we're gonna talk about um, today is the natural environment. Although it's a tiny country, we don't have like large mountains or, or some huge creases or anything, but you know, it's uh, let's say plus minus a couple of hundred uh, meters or let's say our highest peak is lower than a thousand, thousand feet. Um, so it's, it's, it's not like we have a lot of undulation, uh, but we do have a lot of untouched nature. Uh, again, because the, the, um, the density, uh, the living density is pretty low. So yeah, 22% of farmland is organic. 51% of the whole territory is covered by forests. You know, um, literally from any point in the country, the nearest marsh is 10 kilometers away. So currently I'm in the downtown of Tallinn, but Tallinn itself has a few marsh uh, lands. So it's, it's a pretty unique, naturally unique environment. It's pretty amazing. So a little overview of Estonia. I hope you kind of get a picture, like a tiny Nordic, uh, country, pretty digital, um, quite chill, <laughs> trying to invest in people as much as possible. 
So, and that kind of, yeah, brings us to the actual topic of what uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, today is how do we ensure a fair and an equitable transition to a cleaner, healthier planet uh, by looking at how EU is, um, you know, um, addressing regional development in the context of climate uh, change and climate policy. So what we know uh, is that climate change is obviously one of the most, well, it's an existential threat, right? So it's, it's one of the most paramount challenges that faces our civilizations, civilization. Um, and uh, the green transition is both necessary and sort of inevitable uh, if we wanna make sure that we survive as a species. I mean, uh, either way, even if we act now, if we you know, lived up to all the promises given over the last 50 years of climate policy, we would probably still be, you know, not that well uh, off in the next 20, 30 years, let's say. But what the EU has done is that we've committed to a common goal of reaching so-called climate neutrality by 2050. I hope that most of you, and you can nod if you want, <laughs> uh, know what the climate neutrality is. Uh, it's essentially we, yeah, we emit as much as we can sequester. So not pretty simple. So we try to do that by 2050. Estonia as part of the EU has committed to the same goal. Uh, the transition though is not uniform. So obviously some regions suffer more from the transition towards climate neutrality than others. And um, in case of European Union, we have mapped uh, the set of regions that deal with, um, you know, refining, uh, let's say either um, mining for or refining, re um, producing fossil fuels. So basically what our current economy stands for, fossil fuels, that as we need to phase that out, there are regions that depend on it quite heavily. And uh, those regions will probably hurt the most as we you know, try to accomplish our climate targets. So in the spirit of the European Union, uh, a special mechanism was set up, which is called the Just Transition Mechanism. Uh, it was set up in 2020 uh, with the explicit goal of um, helping regions uh, to grapple with the challenges that come up with the climate neutrality. Um, the term this itself, and I mean, here the word just, as I mentioned before, the word just is used in the sense of fairness or fair transition. Uh, the term itself is not new. It's not something that Europe has invented. It's actually been around since the 70s. Uh, there are a bunch of regions and countries that have undergone the just transition in different spheres. Like as far as I know, the United States at some point, this term was used in relation to the nuclear industry. In uh, Germany, it was used in relation to automotive. Uh, and now overall in Europe, we're talking about just transition that is related to climate policy. So it's not like it's new, but it's just, you know, sort of repackaged or used in different, um, in different um, ways in different types of, um, let's say, socioeconomic issues. And uh, in case of the specifically the EU's just transition mechanism um, that we're dealing with currently and uh, that I coordinate in Estonia um, specifically, uh, the goal is to enable regions and people in those regions to address the social, employment, economic, and environmental issue impacts uh, that stem from our climate targets uh, as per the Paris Agreement. So what does the mechanism actually mean? What is a mechanism? Well, essentially, we're talking about money. <laughs> it's a fund. So let's say, or the mechanism itself consists of three different types of finance opportunities. The first one is a fund, uh, which is essentially grants. Uh, that is free money to you know, invest in uh, diversification of the future uh, and future proofing of the economy of the region, creating new jobs, creating new firms, uh, investing in R&D activities, retraining employees of the current fossil fuel sector and so on and so forth. The volume of the fund in Estonia is 340 million, which is not a lot. I mean, sometimes a single plant can cost you like a couple of billion, but in case of Estonia, again, the scales are much smaller. So 300 million is a lot of money for us. Uh, then there is another, uh, let's say, um, strand in the mechanism, which is the budgetary guarantees for the private sector, uh, which aim at supporting investment in sustainable infrastructure by the private investors. So the first one is for sort of everyone. Uh, the second one is specifically for private, private investments, and that's loans. The third one is also loans, but for the public uh, sector already. If we now zoom into Estonia and what the green transition means for us, then, um, I mean, Estonia has been a member of uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change since 1994. I mean, we regained our independence from the uh, Soviet Union in 1991. So three years after that, we're already in the UN, uh, you know, dealing with climate issues. Um, as I already mentioned, we joined the EU's common goal of achieving climate neutrality. And um, yeah, currently the majority of Estonia's energy production is based on fossil fuels. 
Um, most importantly, oil shale. I don't know if you've heard about oil shale. I'm going to introduce that material to you in a second. Uh, but we're doing pretty well. I mean, by now, maybe a third, up to 40% of all our energy consumption is based on um, renewables, uh, which is not bad, but it's definitely not 100. Um, and, uh, and we still have plenty to go until then. So oil shale, I don't know. I don't think oil shale is um, extracted much in the United States. At least I don't think I've heard about it. I think uh, the countries that deal with oil shale are, for example, China has some capacity uh, or some knowledge as to how to use oil shale. Uh, Brazil is another bigger one. But I think Estonia is actually the world leader in extracting and using oil shale because the technology, uh, we have the technology. And the oil shale is essentially, it, it can be compared to coal in the sense that it is a sedimentary rock that contains some organic chemical compounds. So you can burn it directly or you can um, use it in the chemical industry. And uh, in case of oil shale, what you can do is uh, using a process which is called pyrolysis. Uh, pyrolysis is essentially heating the rock up without oxygen. So you don't burn it, but you heat it up to incredible temperatures like 400, 500 degrees Celsius. Uh, basically what you do is you squeeze oil out of it. Uh, so you keep the rock and then the oil just kind of, you know, you can imagine it as a sponge containing water. So you just squeeze the water out of the sponge. The sponge is still there, but the water is out. And then also as a byproduct, you have a gas. So all of those you can use as fossil fuels. And uh, also the shale oil, it's essentially analogous to crude oil. So you can, you know, refine it. You can make it into gasoline. You can have diesel fuel out of it. But it, it just needs some work because it's, a, it's a, let's say, a synthetic oil. It's not just raw. Uh, you know, Brent uh, Mark oil. So oil shale though, although it's a pretty versatile material, it has uh, very high environmental costs. Uh, it actually is more polluting than coal. Um, it uses, or let's say the sector, the oil shale sector in Estonia uses nine times more water than the rest of Estonia combined, including all the different industrial processes, everything that we use in the, you know, the kitchen, like nine times the amount. So it's, it's massive, the amount of processing water in this uh, sector. Then it also produces 90% of all waste uh, by mass, obviously, uh, not like plastic waste, but mass of removed, uh, let's say, terrain and things like this, which is qualified as waste as well. And it's incredibly high uh, CO2 intensive. So that makes it into Estonia's highest polluter. And surprise, surprise, the, uh, the oil shell sector is really highly concentrated in one specific region, which is also my home region. It's called Idaviruma. Um, so as uh, Jenny said in the beginning, I used to work in a, in a city called Narva, which is the easternmost city of Estonia and is located in this region. So for me, the just transition mechanism or dealing with this oil shale, phasing out oil shale in Estonia and trying to kind of provide for a new future in, in, in that particular region uh, without oil, oil shale is sort of a mission, <laughs> you know, since it's my home region. I want to, this is something that I really want to do. So Ida Viruma, um, basically the, for that reason that oil shale is concentrated in that one region, that single region is responsible for over 50% of Estonia's total greenhouse gas emissions. And it's not like Ida Viruma is, let's say the, the industrial powerhouse of Estonia, no. Uh, most of the industry, most of the economic development is actually around Tallinn, which is the capital region. Tallinn, Tartu, a bunch of other places. But Ida Viruma, since we produce energy for Estonia and we use oil shale to do that, then it is one of the most polluting regions. And that means that obviously in case, if we now apply the European just transition framework uh, on Estonia, then it's obvious that the Ida Viru is the target region, right? So since we depend the most on producing and refining fossil fuels, which is in our case, oil shale. Um, the transition um, in Ida Viruma has the potential to exacerbate the challenges that are already present in the region. And uh, unfortunately, there are plenty. So Ida Viruma is, um, as I said, easternmost. It's right on the border with Russia. Uh, the absolute majority of people there speak Russian as their mother tongue. So if in Estonia, you know, you speak Estonian, which is a language very similar to Finnish uh, or Hungarian, it's in the same family group, in the same family of languages as, as Finnish or Hungarian. But uh, it, specifically in Ida Viruma, uh, more than 80% of people speak Russian as their mother tongue. And that's a historic legacy since uh, after the Second World War, when Russia invaded Estonia, then a lot of Russian people were essentially imported into Estonia to, you know, to build the factories, to establish the industry of the Soviet Union. And then after Estonia regained independence in, 2000, in 1991, 
a lot of people stay. So, so we have that, let's say, um, a language factor in Ida Viroma, which is the last point here, but it's sort of a very important sort of for setting the context of what we're dealing with. The population of the region is decreasing. Um, uh, it's decreased by about a third since 1990s. The incomes are among of the nation's lowest. The, uh, um, uh, let's say the uh, gender pay gap is among of the nation's highest. Uh, the unemployment again is one of the nation's highest. So not a very good mixture. I mean, Ida Viruma has been struggling um, ever since uh, Estonia regained its independence with the, you know, with the closure of industry and everything. Um, if we take a look at the oil shell sector in Ida Viruma specifically, then it's, you know, it's been, the oil shell sector has been around since the 20s. That's when they first started using oil shell as an energy, energy source on an industrial scale. Uh, the sector amounts for about 5% of national economy, obviously a much bigger chunk of Ida Viruma's local economy. It is the largest employer um, in the region. And the largest employer in there is the state-owned energy company called Esti Energia. Um, and the transition has actually been ongoing. I mean, again, climate transition is nothing new. Uh, technology is advancing. We're trying to hit our climate targets. So ever since the 80s, the, 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 the sector has actually been in transition or in sort of has been shrinking. So if in 1980s, over 14,000 people have worked in the mines alone, mining oil shale, then currently the whole um, employment in the region, in the, in the sector stands at about 5,000 people. So it's shrunk quite a bit. And obviously the oil shale has also defined the identity of the region quite, quite strongly. So people associate themselves with this industry. They associate themselves with, you know, providing power for the entire country. It's, it's a matter of pride, it's a matter of identity. So when you try to phase out oil shale, you're not, you know, you're not phasing out a sedimentary rock that contains some compounds. You're actually trying to kind of update a region's entire identity. It's a, it's a really tough challenge. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of you can relate because every different region has to go through transitions like this once in a while. You know, if it's industrial transition, maybe, I don't know, in, uh, I guess West Virginia, coal would be similar, right? So, um, so yeah, it's nothing new, but but it's it's a complex environment, especially when we when we talk about people who speak a different language than the national language, uh, in their majority. So it's it's tough. Uh, and yeah, impacts of the transition. Not going to go into too much detail on this. Uh, it's uh, I think it's pretty obvious. A cascading economic impact, you know, impact on employment, training, social security, migration decisions, environment, you name it pretty much all over the board. Um, and as I already mentioned that in case of the just transition in Estonia, the stakes are kind of high uh, because the local community has not yet fully recovered from the identity crisis uh, that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union some 30, 30 years ago. <laughs> I wish it was 30,000 years ago, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, so we, we sort of have to get this one right. Um, so how do you approach a transition like this? Like in case, in, in our case, what was clear, and as I mentioned before, Estonia, we don't only like to tell about us being horizontal, but we actually do like to be horizontal. So, so in that sense, what we've done is in preparing this strategic transition, we've tried to keep it as horizontal as possible to reach out to as many people as possible. And uh, we have tried to, implement a very comprehensive partnership, partnership uh, with the local uh, community. So on the national level we, have, level, we have a steering committee that was set up by the Ministry of Finance that I work for. Uh, and it, it um, is comprised of some 20 different stakeholders, uh, both uh, regional, local, both NGOs and governmental, um, you know, representatives of employers, uh, trade unions. So we have them all sort of in one, the steering committee overlooking the process of the just transition, making sure that everybody's heard um, and everybody's concerns are voiced, you know, not, not silenced and everybody can just kind of participate in the discussion. Then in, on a wider level, on the regional level, we have a regional just transition platform uh, that has even more stakeholders, uh, but it's a very like, it's much more, um, let's say, um, uh, much more local based. Um, so some of the stakeholders are the same, but, but they're the, obviously the regional level attracts more of the local smaller actors. Then we have some soft networking structures such as the local uh, touristic uh, cluster. We have a create, um, creative economy cluster. Uh, we have a scientific council. So they're also obviously involved in the process. And we've carried out like these general public consultation activities as well. So seminars, formal written, written procedures, 
um, you know, focus groups, you name it. Um, and what is also nice is that on the one hand, okay, we deal with the implementation of a specific uh, money instrument or with specific fund in a specific territory. But what that, that process has initiated is a general reconsideration of the region's own identity. So they started preparing their own uh, strategic plan as part, of, well, essentially we, it helps us to have that from them in the process of preparing the just transition plan, obviously and communicating with the European Union, but uh, it's very nice that it was like a self-initiated initiative uh, from the regional partners themselves that they saw that, okay, we are gonna enter into something completely new. We need to have a plan, which is not a governmental plan, which is not a top-down plan, but which is like, a, you know, ground up, which is very nice. Um, if we take about if we take a look specifically at the public outreach, this is like a quick, um, let's say, uh, tangent from from the main from the main story. Uh, is that the public out for in to, to to kind of ask people for opinion of what how do they see the Vietnam in the future? We carried out a public uh, opinion poll in 2020 in the summer 2020, and uh, yielded some you know one and a half or 1,500 responses. Uh, doesn't sound like a lot, but again for the region it's quite a bit. Uh, I mean, it's uh, representative of at least one point something percent of the entire population of the region, so not that bad. And uh, some of the findings that we, um, some of the major findings were that uh, the respondents were uh, very satisfied with the natural environment of the of the region, surprisingly, uh, because it's one of the dirtiest regions in Estonia, obviously. <laughs> then, you know, they're also satisfied with attractions and the region's cultural diversity, uh, which is again, really strange because I mean, there isn't much, but anyway, so people are satisfied with, with really interesting things. Uh, uh, then what they saw as the most important things were in the, let's say in the future is job creation, development of new businesses, uh, competitive wages, you know, finding new functions for unused mining and industrial sites. So nothing too surprising. It's sort of what you would expect for a typical community to respond. If you ask them, okay, we want to phase out this, what, what do you want? And this is what you would typically get. But what what was interesting and what made us focus actually, I'm not gonna talk about the youth in, in a lot of detail, uh, but we do have a separate, a few separate initiatives for the youth in this general process, because what we saw is that their responses diverge from the general population. So the youth region, living in that region, they see the future differently. And uh, to put it sort of bluntly, they are the ones that are gonna be living there the longest. <laughs> so, so in that sense, we need to make sure that the future that we're building is not just you know this mean general of what you like, what you don't like of the general population, but you do need to zoom in on the youth. And so what they were not satisfied were the region's attractions and the cultural diversity. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'm a slightly younger representative of Vida Roma, I'm only 35. So in that sense, I can totally relate to the, to the younger generation's feedback of like, yeah, no, our built environment is not that great. Our public spaces are not that great either. You know, what we could uh, do more of is not, you know, this uh, hardcore industrial development, but we should probably develop uh, renewable energy instead. So the, the focuses are a little different, um, which, is, which is really important for us um, to, to, you know, steer the process of how do we prioritize investment in the future. And the cutest thing, obviously, is that what do the youth value? The value friendliness and kindness. That's something that's uh, kind of came up in a bunch of uh, different uh, focus groups that we've done, is that the value is that it's so simple. Uh, but the sad part is that that's something that they don't necessarily see in the current older generation of the region. So it's, uh, you know, you have a, so in addition to everything, all the challenges that we've already talked about, you also have like this slight disconnect uh, inside the region between the different uh, age groups, which is also something that we need to address in, in one way or the other. So in that sense, it's uh, just a quick remark on, on if you are involved in strategic processes and you do, uh, let's say, something that is future oriented and you ask for opinions, do look at the youth separately. They do have a, a different outlook on how the future should look like. And sometimes it's very cute and, and idealistic, but there are certain things that are very valuable as well. So preparing the transition, um, it's been a massive process of more than two years. Uh, so it started off in the spring and summer 2020 with, let's say, a region-wide brainstorming session. Then we switched to like recrystallize the received proposals into as you know into a plan of sorts. Then we started drafting the actual strategic documents. 
After that, uh, we've had informal, informal and formal negotiations with the European Commission because the European Commission is the one dispersing the money. And now we're just now entering into this new chapter or this new phase of actual implementation of the plan. So we have the plan written up, but now we're hitting the ground. And uh, uh, this is super exciting because we're going to see if the plan, I mean, the plan looks great and the European Commission was really happy about it, but we'll see if it actually works. I mean, I sure hope it does because I was the one who wrote it. So, <laughs> so but we'll see. I mean, you know, um, yeah, hope for the best. Uh, the major development needs are not surprising again, uh, restructuring the economy of the region, uh, supporting the people and communities. Um, and we're talking about some even individual communities, like for example, specifically oil shale miners, uh, you know, or let's say the people working in the energy sector in the power plants. Uh, so we do need to be really granular about what kind of communities we're talking about, not just generally the community of Itaviruma, but like some really specific uh, target groups. And then obviously alleviating the environmental impacts related to the, let's say, legacy, legacy impacts uh, related to the oil shale mining and processing activities. Uh, depend from that, uh, we developed an actual, let's say, budget of what are we going to do. So we have 340 million. We're going to you know, put 80% of it into economy and labor actions and then 20% into environmental and social stuff. Uh, the split of this sort was uh, actually... Uh, really clear example of how the local community has influenced decision making on the national level because the minister of finance initially proposed a 60 to 40 split because we thought that okay 60 to you know economy and labor and then 40 to everything else because there are a lot of issues that we need to deal with but the local community sort of well <laughs> we had some really heated discussions as to it like no this specific fund needs to go towards job creation this is the highest priority in our region. This is what we lack the most. This is what, you know, if we close the oil shell, uh, uh, let's say, sector at some point in the midterm future, then jobs is what we need. So we need to invest most of these funds into this particular, um, let's say, set of actions, which involves, you know, investing into enterprises, uh, increasing uh, knowledge intensity of enterprises, including uh, in, in increasing the volume of in-service training and vocational higher education offering. So things like this, things that have to do with economy and labor and everything else, we have other funds for that. Okay, we can have 20% of the JTF, the Just Transition Fund uh, for this, for, you know, the, I don't know, district heating and then cleaning up old, uh, you know, legacy, uh, let's say shale mines and whatever, but we'll deal with that with other funds. Uh, let's focus on, on actually making a new uh, economy for the region. So as I said, we're now switching, and this is just a couple of, you know, last couple of slides, and then we can finally switch to discussion. Um, so how are we doing? You know, uh, currently we're doing like this. I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of us can ask this question. It's like, oh, what a decade this year has been, right? I mean, what have we not had? We had, uh, we had a number of crises, one on top of the other. Uh, you know, like in case of us, which is, a, again, a North European nation right next to Russia, uh, Russia's invasion into Ukraine has, you know, for a moment sort of, well, made everyone uneasy. Uh, but thankfully, we are a member of EU. We are a member of NATO. Our prime minister has been really adamant about how the EU should be acting. I mean, you've probably heard about her in news, Kaya Kallas. Uh, she's been one of the most outspoken, let's say, pressers against uh, Russia, uh, because I mean, Estonia has been under the Russian invasion for like over 50 years. Sort of know how it goes, you know? <laughs> so so it, it's, um, it's, it's been really incredible how in case of the invasion, uh, Russia's invasion into Ukraine, Estonia has actually been very, uh, let's say helpful for, for seeing how the European Union is gonna react. Um, so in our case, it was a way for us to shine in a sense. Um, but also Estonia has accepted a, a large number of, of Ukrainian refugees. I'm, I think in the series that we're currently in, you are going to hear about Ukrainian refugees uh, from a different speaker. Uh, but like in case of Estonia, for example, the, the refugees that we've accepted and who have actually stayed in Estonia for now, um, they comprise almost 5% of the population. You can imagine that for a tiny country, 5% is a lot. I mean, it's four point something, but it's like, the you know, the magnitude of numbers is like this. Um, obviously, the energy crisis that also stemmed partially from the Russia's invasion is a considerable stress test uh, for years climate ambition, but also a source of confusion for oil shale sectors workers because what we we heat our homes with everything you can possibly with, with everything you can right now, including oil shale that we've kind of sworn that we're going to exit. 
So for the workers of the sector, it's a little bit of like, okay, guys, so what are we doing? Are we like, are we renewables or are we oil shale? What do you want us to do? So it's it's a little, you know, it's a little unclear at, at the moment. What is clear is that um, Estonia is standing by its climate commitments. So we've been pretty, you know, outspoken about this, uh, that we are investing. Yes, we are going to phase out oil shale at some point, regardless of the invasion. Again, the climate crisis is an existential threat. It's not a nice thing. It's it's not something that we should probably do when we have time. It's an existential threat of magnitude the same as when, you know, the nukes that Russia is uh, threatening. So in that sense, we still have to do with that too. Uh, also, Estonia was... Um, how do I say, before we got the, fi the final okay from the European Commission, we already started implementing certain measures. So we had a good head start on the JTF implementation, which is also very helpful. And then the European Commission itself has been really nice, or how do I say, like helpful and friendly. Uh, we've had a really constructive dialogue. The president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, came to Narva in the Deviruma in uh, the beginning of October, which was amazing because it's not every day. Uh, or every year or every decade that uh, <laughs> that the president of the European Commission visits Ida Viruma specifically. So so that was amazing to just kind of keep, you know, the camaraderie and keep the, the sense that, okay, we're all in this together. Uh, as I said, the very first um, measure is already open and we already had our first uh, investment, which is a synthered rare earth magnets factory in Ida Viruma, which is like a major a strategic investment by a company which is actually Canadian owned or like traded on Canadian stock exchange. Uh, so yeah, here's to international business. And this has really, let's say, kicked the process into a higher gear in the sense of like before we were devising plans where we're talking about how the future is going to be, how it's going to be, be great and green and, and, you know, and all of that. But now you have an actual investor who is putting real money and, uh, and we have actual support for them. And this is like real jobs. So a lot of people were like, okay, Seems like they're in business, you know, like it's been a great talk for two years. So some people have already sort of gotten tired of it. Uh, and this investment was like, yes, okay, now we're, we can get going on this stuff. So it was really, um, really important for us to get this. Um, and yeah, uh, for the sector's workers, uh, seeing the JTF hit the ground uh, makes the transition real. I mean, this is the group that we are mostly, and I personally am a very much... Um, um, how do I say, attached to, uh, because I know a lot of them personally, again, as being the resident of that region, um, I've, I've met, met them in different roles before. So, so for me, it's really great to see how their attitude has changed with time that of like, of like, oh no, it's not something that we, you know, climate change doesn't exist to, okay, fine, there is climate change, but we don't want to change. And then, you know, to finally getting to the point of like, okay, so you're saying there's going to be support for like new training. Great. Where can I go? You know, where can I sign up? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a massive change uh, in these two years that we've undergone, which is which is incredible, and this speaks to let's say the main uh, probably the guiding principle or the let's say the the main thread of the lecture too or of the series of lectures that you guys are having this humanitarian aspect. How do you how do you bring about this fairness in such a way that people actually you know. You try to do it from the first, from the get-go, but but people don't take it that way. So how do you bring them, how do you kind of, in a caring way, bring them on this journey and then, you know, lead them towards that future, which is very scary to them, which uh, so a lot of them are like 50 plus, uh, you know, people people in the age category, 50 plus, they've worked in the, in the sector for 20 plus years. So it is scary for them to go into other sectors, into other economy, you know, uh, fields, economic fields to start. I don't know, a new life as an entrepreneur. So how do you do that? How do you do, how do you guide people into that future? So yeah, for, for, for me personally and for the JTF, the, the whole just transition, the word just stands for, for them. So in that sense, that's why they are the most important uh, actor and also beneficiary in a sense of this whole, of this whole thing. Um, and it's nice to see that the transition is getting tangible for them. Uh, but obviously, it's a long road ahead. I mean, we're just starting with the implementation, so we're off to a good start. Uh, but there are some pretty challenging deadlines in the, ahead of us. Um, there is a pretty tough micro uh, macroeconomic environment. Uh, I mean, you know, there is an ongoing energy crisis. Uh, and so we need to kind of, in, in view of all of this, we can't give up on our larger picture. Uh, we need to keep in mind the why we're doing this. But at the same time, we still need to be agile as to how we, you know, address different challenges that come up. Um, but yeah, this why is what I wanted probably to 
to to to leave you guys with is you know all of this this funding the whole lecture was about like this region this funding this money these people la 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 there's a lot you know we invest in this and this and that but why are we doing this in the first place I mean we're trying to sort of save humankind you know uh, one tiny region at a time I'd say and uh, that one tiny region at the time also needs to be done in a fair way so so this I guess would be my message to you and uh, now if you have any questions I'd be super happy to take them and thank you. Ivan, thank you so much. Your presentation was so fascinating and such impressive work and excitement on the horizon for where this is all going to go. So I just appreciate you, we all do, um, having you speak on this topic. I have one question and I'll, I want to open the door for everybody else too. So when I saw the map you pulled up and Ida Viruma just being so adjacent to Russia mm -hmm. and knowing that this is like a power hub, tr trying to tra transition away, of course, from the oil shale, but into other um, climate resources. Are there ever, and I'm sure there are, but would like, I'm curious around the sort of worry, like vulnerabilities in terms of how close it is to Russia and how Russia, have they ever tried to exploit that knowing or, or are there contingencies in place around the just transition um, like I guess thinking around like those vulnerabilities that Russia could potentially exploit, like knowing that this is a a hub for, you know, energy resources and whatnot. I couldn't help but to sort of see that visually on the map with how close it's, it is to Russia. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and that's a very typical or like a very usual and human response to the to the map. When you see yeah. that when you see that picture, that is like the immediate thought. That comes to mind um and i mean when you look at it and i've i've seen this happen so many times with people when they look at the map and then they see they're like oh my god this is like you know uh, the edge of the civilized world and then there is this you know mortar right there and and uh, you know it, it all looks scary on the map then the, the funny thing is that when you come to Hidavirma, when you come to narva and when you have a beer on the you know we have like a, a river between estonia NATO, the European Union, and then Russia. There is like a river, which is called Narva. And you have like a bar there. And then when you, you know, sit there and you drink your beer and then you listen to the dog bark on the Russian side, you understand that, you know, um, you can you can live here. I mean, if you, if you try to kind of keep it human, you know. <laughs> but if you look at the geopolitical side of things, not the, I mean, the human aspect is always much cuter than, you know, some of the geopolitical things. Um, of course, there is vulnerability. I mean, of course, it's uh, for, as I said, in the beginning uh, of the invasion in Ukraine, a lot of investment projects were, were put on hold uh, just because nobody knew what's going to happen. And we are right there. The difference between Estonia and Ukraine um, has been and is uh, that Estonia is a very active member of both NATO and the EU. So if you go into Estonia, then that's kind of that's big deal. Um, it's not, you know, it's not gray. It's it's black and white. Like if you if you go into Estonia, you attack NATO, and with that you attack everybody who's part of NATO. So so that kind of holds us, you know, feeling secure. That's uh, essentially what also provides security for the investors, um, and you know keeps them, let's say, um, you know, happy uh, or 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 feeling secure over there. On the other side, or on the other hand. Again, to just kind of show how Estonia is involved in the NATO community is that the NATO cyber defense headquarters are located in Tallinn, Estonia. So, you know, it's like really the integral part. It's not just some far off corner of the, you know, of, of the block. And then so it no, no, nobody cares what happens to it now. It's, it's like some pretty critical stuff. So, so that helps. Uh, but on the other hand, <laughs> I mean, I think... Uh, uh, Russia probably feels its own vulnerabilities much more right now than we feel ours. Thankfully, I mean the the invasion has obviously been a complete miserable failure, and uh, you know I mean Russia is good at throwing bodies at things. Unfortunately, I mean we've seen this in the Napoleonic Wars, we've seen this during the you know the Second World War, and obviously we're seeing it right now with the you know sort of not really mobilization, sort of but not really war, as they put it. Uh, you know, so there is a lot of human resource, unfortunately, that you can throw, you know, and make uh, cutlets out of it. But uh, 
But at some point, it's just I, I don't think uh, Russia is what it used to be. Um, we now all see that it's not quite the, the capabilities that were bluffed in our face are not quite what are there on the, you know, on the ground. So in that sense, I think <laughs> as, uh, as one of our commanders of our army said, it's never been so quiet on the eastern uh, frontier as it has been over the last year. Mm -hmm. Because all the forces are down south, like Estonia is actually enjoying really peace and quiet at this moment, which is nice. I mean, works for us. It's unfortunate for the Ukrainians, obviously. And, and it's, again, Estonia has been one of the first countries to send military uh, equipment to Ukraine. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, accept a lot of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, we can't do too much because we're a tiny country, but we're trying to help as much as we possibly can. Again, because there is historic legacy uh, of this stuff. Uh, people in power currently in Estonia remember all of this too well. Yeah, thank you, Ivan. Um, in the com I see Adam has his hand raised and I, there's a comment here um, in the chat. In the spirit of wanting to inspire others to develop a commitment to environmental justice, what would you say was most influential in developing your own passion for the Just Transition Initiative? Was it an education, a teacher, your family, something else? Like my own personal, you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, I think it's a, it's a number of things. Um, I mean, it's a, sort of a long story, but um, one of maybe a very basic thing uh, was that my dad um, uh, was a great hunter. Uh, he, he, uh, he passed away as well a few months ago, but, but um, he used to take me hunting when I was like a baby, not a baby, obviously, but like a, a pretty young boy. Uh, but the way he would take me hunting is not that, okay, here's a rifle and this is how you shoot it, you know? Uh, the, the going hunting process involved feeding the, you know, the, the deer in the winter because it's really, it's dreadfully cold here in the winter. So the hunters over here in Estonia would, they would have speci special sheds that the deer could come and eat at, and you would not touch them until the hunting season, you know? So, so you care, you don't just, it's a little bit like, I don't know, if you've seen the movie Avatar, uh, then it's a nice an analogy. So yes, sometimes you do need to, you know, kill uh, another species or another being, but you need to be thankful for the energy that it provides to you. You need to respect that being. You can't just like shoot them, you know, in, in massive numbers just for fun. So that's something that came, I think, uh, a value that uh, my dad instilled in me through this hunting, paradoxically, right? Usually you don't see hunting as a, as a very, you know, friendly enterprise, let's say. But in, in case of my dad, this is how it was. And I think with that, it just kind of grew uh, because we've, um, you know, done a lot of outdoorsy stuff. Um, and then at some point when I was in Narva, I think when the click happened for me to go into active climate policy making or being involved in climate policy through Currently, the JTF, before I was involved in this, I actually worked for the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs and Communications, and I was heading the um, Estonia's, um, let's how do I say, curating the field of uh, sustainable architecture and sustainable development. So I've been in this kind of general climate policy stuff for, for a little while, but it happened when I was flying actually from Narva to, for a family vacation. And I was looking, we just finished the application for the cultural capital title in Narva. Uh, we lost it. Um, and so obviously there was a little bit of like a, you know, melancholia. And so I was flying uh, across Europe and I was looking at all those tiny towns and Narva is only like 50,000 people. So it's a tiny town. And I looked at them and I was like, you know, it really in the bigger scheme of things, it, it, does, it doesn't make a blip of a difference whether we get that, you know, European capital culture title or not, if we don't deal with the major stuff. And the major stuff is obviously the climate, because we all depend on it. And I mean, I just kind of snapped them, I think that's when I decided that I'm going to leave Narva, I'm going to go and try to uh, kind of uh, reprofile myself towards climate issues. Uh, I'm not a climate scientist. I mean, I'm an architect. But, um, but that was when for me, the click happened. Um, but obviously, all the, you know, previous uh, experiences also helped to a degree. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, Adam, would you like to ask your question? And I think we have another from Pam. 
Sure. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, this has been great. Um, uh, you know, you're, you mentioned you went to Virginia Tech, right? So you're probably familiar with kind of Southwest Virginia, which is what I think about, right? Kind of industry that left, right? Uh, generations who were kind of now left jobless, right? Typically older and usually replaced with uh, industry that, right, relies on new technology, right? And there's a difficulty there with the older generations kind of adapting. So what is the thought or approach to how, how do you educate and train? Uh, you know, you mentioned that, but what is the approach to uh, um, giving the, those older generations the ability to actually be part of the workforce as those new industry, new, te new technology kind of uh, replaces the old? Okay, great question. Thank you. Uh, this is currently one of the major things that I'm working on, uh, because uh, I mean, now that the plan is written up, now that the first investments are happening, we can see what kind of jobs are going to be emerging. Um, now we've been dealing much more um, with much more focus dealing with uh, trade unions, uh, their members, um, seeing how to get them, let's say, you know, how to make sure that the transition is fair for them. I mean, the trade unions have been on board throughout this process. I mean, they were pretty critical at first, uh, but I think they kind of got used to the idea uh, by now that, okay, this stuff is inevitable. We need to do something. So I think one thing to learn from this is inevitability. Like you need to make sure that people understand that there is no other choice. Like it might sound a little harsh, but that's the truth. Like if, if there is a tidal wave going, you know, called climate change coming your way and you need to change the way of how how you live how you make energy and all of that you need to make sure that you know it's inevitable that you need to change how do you bring those people on 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 board with that change that's uh i mean the only thing i can um uh say uh in addition to this uh on one hand inevitability or like illustrating the inevitability of the thing is to give the road of how do you, okay so how do we make it through there and, and this road needs to be developed in very close cooperation with those people. So it's, it's not like, I mean, in our case, it's not even just the trade unions. Uh, it's the members of the trade unions. You know, we, we speak to individual people um, uh, and we develop the measures for, for example, training with them. And I mean, with them, meaning like yeah, just yesterday, I went to the region and I met with uh, two uh, trade union representatives or like the representatives of two separate trade unions um, separately because ones are the chemists uh, who work in the shale oil business in uh, one town and the other ones are in the other town and so we talked with them I, sh I shared with them what we're planning and then asked for their feedback and then you know um, they for example they told me that okay since higher education in Estonia is um, is an Estonian and we're mostly Russian speaking then we're out like we, we can't do higher education in Estonian because you know we just don't we don't have the language and so the thing you would do is you would be like okay maybe the higher education okay let's leave that for maybe younger people maybe for you know people who are not 50 plus but uh, what you can do is based on those programs of higher education that we're going to establish we're going to have micro degrees for you guys that can be taught in Russian so there is like a legal way to do that you know so you actually literally sit down with them and you figure out how to make this thing work it's not that we're going to make you know new phd degrees or master's degrees and everybody's going to be happy and yeah you know they're not like you, you, maybe they won't be even able to apply for them but they will still be beneficiaries of these initiatives through some other channel and in order to do that i mean you can't do that from like an office in Tallinn. you have to go and present your ideas and be ready for, you know, trade union people are usually pretty emotional and they're, especially when they're kind of squeezed against the wall with this whole climate transition thing, you know, that some of them don't even still believe that is happening. But by now they know that it's gone, you know, regardless of whether you believe in it or you don't believe in it, you know that the change is going to happen. So in that sense, uh, um, you know, you sit down with them and you talk with them and you try to figure it out. And when you can figure certain things out, you're honest about it. You know, it's it's a very human process in that sense. Like it's it's remarkable human, and it's what makes it beautiful. But it's also something that requires a massive amount of hours. So there is no way to shortcut this thing. Like you know, you know, you can't do like an online questionnaire because half of them don't use internet. You know, it's it's like <laughs> there is no 
yeah, there is no shortcut. And certain things you just need to go there and, you know, check yourself in a hotel for a week and just live with them. For me, I mean, you, it helps that I'm from that region. So I actually go and stay at my mom's, you know, and then make my trips. And I, I know those people and they can, they know they can trust me. So in that sense, that, that also helps, obviously having someone, when you deal with a specific community, having someone who can, who has an in into that community uh, is also very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. You know, and when you talk through, this is such a huge, large scale change management process, but there are a lot of parallels in human resources. So some of the things that you were saying just now in the conversations, you have to go meet with people and it's difficult because you're dealing with humans and there's all the emotion and all of the variables. So a lot of parallels here, but yours is on very large scale. So it's just super impressive. I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, Pam, did you want to, it looks like you've had your hand raised. So I wanted to give you an opportunity. Uh, thank you, Ivan. You have answered some of my questions, but I had one. Is there anything in Estonia climate wise or like concrete that people can see that, oh, climate change is real? I'd say in Virginia, when people hear that the water's rising in Norfolk and Norfolk may be no more, you know, that's a major military base that's, uh, a major employer. To me, mm -hmm. that I've talked to people who, when they hear that, they start paying more attention because that's something that affects, you know, Virginians. Is there anything like that in Estonia that people see? Because otherwise, I think it's very difficult to convince people. It is very difficult. Uh, even more difficult is that with climate change, our weather is actually going to get better. So it's, uh, you know, because uh -huh. we're north it's actually gonna get like the winters are gonna get milder and so it's really difficult to convince people that oh climate you know climate warming global warming we have to do something about it they're like whatever you know i have to travel less so in that sense uh not really like we still have winters we still have blizzards what people have noticed probably is the um how do i say the intensity of certain of certain weather phenomena like, um, like here, like, storms yeah, so yeah. so you, you we've had you know winters always, but there are, now there are like blizzards. It, you know it, when it rains, it pours. It doesn't rain, it pours, and things like this. So there is a certain change in intensity of things, but it's mm -hmm. it's very subtle. And there is always someone who says, "Oh yeah, I remember in 1986 we had the same thing." You know, it, it's like it doesn't reach far enough. But I think what Estonia has mostly understood, or how we're trying to, how do I say? Uh, the way the, the angles that I found are actually economic angles, uh, economic and also migration, uh, because Estonia is a tiny country. And uh, if we speak about, you know, 1.3 million people as a separate country, and then we imagine the migration, you know, wave from, let's say, the, you know, southern Europe, which is getting pretty hot by now, then uh, there is, I mean, Estonians are really proud of their culture. And climate change might not influence climate in Estonia that much, but it will influence the way we, you know, accept people into our society, the way our society changes. So that is a very, that is a very painful aspect for Estonians, just considering that there is like a million of us. So, you know, um, so that is one angle through which people have started to understand climate change. Uh, I think more um, in a more, um, how do I say, like uh, in a more, it's become more real. Uh, in this in the sense um, and then the other one is economic yeah so we might not uh, believe in climate change or whatever but the green transition is ongoing our trade partners are switching to renewable you know like for example a very specific um, very specific specific example because of the cleaner energy mix in Finland the products made in Finland which is our neighboring country uh, are actually more uh, competitive on the market than ours because our energy mix is dirtier. So now in the economy where people look at, for example, you know, the, um, uh, you have these separate certificates for, for different, for example, building or construction materials uh, that show you how much, you know, what the energy intensity has been or what's the emission related to producing this particular piece of, uh, of construction material. Then uh, if you take completely separate, uh, exactly the same materials, one in Estonia would be less competitive. So through this, again, you can address uh, climate change issue. Again, it's not direct, but it's uh, sort of this roundabout way. Um, but still, it works. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you so much, Ivan. Um, we are at time. It's been amazing having you here um, and listening to this topic. It's, it was just so interesting. You're doing amazing work. Um, and so I think that's it for today. So, you know, I wish you well in the rest of your journey and the, the fantastic work that you're doing that really benefits us all around the globe at the end of the day. So thank you. Um, and thanks everybody else for being here. Appreciate you, Ivan. Take care. Thank you so much, Ivan. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye.